baseball is dead. Rest in peace. It's a big day for Dallas Braden. It's a big day for Dallas Braden, and he's he's sitting over here pretending like I don't know. I don't know what you guys are talking about. I don't know what you guys are saying. I don't, I don't, know, I don't know why it would be a big day for me. I don't know if there's a crossover somewhere. Maybe, maybe there's something going on in baseball where maybe I have an area of expertise that I can speak on outside of the game of baseball. I don't know. I don't what's, know, Quabbis. What are you talking about? What's going on? Well, listen, man. There was a... There was an incident last night. I know that you were on the air. I know that uh, the A's were playing the Pirates, the Brayden Bowl, as they say. But there was something happening last night, Dallas, in Arizona. Mm. There was a delay of sorts. There was. It was two hours. It was two mm-hmm. hours long. Mm-hmm. And if only this had happened when the Green and Gold were in town, you probably would have seen Dallas Braden out there. Dallas Braden would have been the guy that was up on the backstop being like, hey, listen, everyone, I know that there's a moment of panic happening right now, but DB's got this. Yeah. Uh, can, can you walk us through just kind of how something like this ha- happens in the first place and how would how would you have handled it um so what happens initially is- well, hold on let me stop you right there okay. for anyone that's listening right now that doesn't know dallas Braden in his spare time is basically a beekeeper like not, he has not basically be- he is a beekeeper <laughs> yeah i don't dallas i don't Braden just have, is a beekeeper i don't just have bees living in our vicinity that we're okay with and friendly with no 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 we Yes, we raise bees. My wife and I are apiarists. We are beekeepers. That's what that is. Um, <laughs> so yeah, very familiar with And your it. children. And our children. Yes, our, our kids go up in the hive. They are actively helping us. They're holding frames. They can point out the difference between larvae and eggs, which is, it's not a huge difference. Sometimes you're like, oh, is that a lot? Oh, no, th- those are just eggs. Like, so- there's a lot going on. They're a part of it. We're all a part of it. So when that happened, like my wife instantly texted me, was like, yo, are you seeing, like, you see what's going on in the Dodger game? You see what's going on in the time? And so I was like, what? like she legitimately was on it before I knew about it. And mm. then we obviously catch wind of it. And we're like, no way, really, this is going on. So we did like a half inning on the Dodger Diamondback game. During our game, we did not even mm. like we didn't even call the half inning or whatever. Um, and yeah, I just broke it down. Like, wh- how did we get here? What's going on? And uh, it was it well, break was it, break it down here. Is this like a is this like a Mark Wahlberg situation where he's like, if I was there, would have gone down differently? Like, are you watching the B situation going on at the D backs Dodgers game being like if DB was there, this this wouldn't go down this way. It wouldn't take. Wouldn't take two hours to get this game going. I have this first pitch going in ten minutes. Well, it's it's uh, it's interesting because when I watch them start to break out the, um, I'll call it anesthetic because I still don't know exactly what was used because I haven't been able to like dive in. I I didn't get to hear the the interview afterwards, but from what I understand, it was like a calming agent. I I don't I don't know what was used. Um. Because typically you use smoke when you're going into the beehive to calm the bees down. Um, and you don't want to inundate them with smoke because then you can cross the line, you piss them off. Um, so when I saw him spraying this this hive down, not hive, this colony, when I saw him spraying this colony down, I started to panic. I was like, fuck, no way. Come on, tell me you're not you're not doing you're not killing these bees. Um, because he was spraying them and then vacuuming them. Right. And that's safe. That's safe to vacuum them is safe. They're very hardy insects. So there's, they'll survive that, that, that trip through the fucking vacuum and into the bin. They'll, they'll be good to go. Um, because the idea is you want to locate the queen safely. Now let's rewind. And how did we get to this point where these bees are hanging out on this, on this netting, Mm. on this cord, Mm, this cable. Well, mm-hmm. that what you saw is a swarm. Bees swarm for a number of reasons. Uh, it could be weather related, uh, could be colony size related, which is what I believe probably happened because as the weather is changing, the colony starts to grow. And if the colony does not have room within the hive to 
build out and continue to grow, they will leave. They will leave. They will pack their shit up and go, all right, hey, we got to get out of here. There's there's no room. The queen, like, you know, she's not doing great. She she needs a little more room. She can't lay anywhere. Uh, it's getting a little tidy in here, folks. We, we, we got to go. We got to go. So they'll leave. They'll swarm and gather. Basically, like it's everybody calling, right? Like, hey, meet up over here. Hey, meet, meet. everybody meets up. And now from there, they will go and find a new location. So they will stay there on that on that cable and then they will send out drones and they will send out other workers and they will go and locate or they will go and search for food, water, and shelter. And wherever those bees end up finding that, they will then fly back. So they would come back to that cable and then they would start to send out messages and they would point their bodies in a certain direction so like if all four of us went out looking for something, whichever one of us came back and basically did a more emphatic and more demonstrative dance, we would be dancing in the direction of our shit, right? So, you know, Jared would be like, hey, we're over here. And I'd be like, hey, we're over here. And Jade would be like, no, we're over there. And Jake would be like, bitches, we're going over here. We're going <laughs> over here. And we would all just pack our shit up. And follow Jake because Jake threw the strongest signal out there. That's probably the the most hardy resource we can gather at this moment. That's what's best for the hive. That's what's best for the colony. We're out. So ultimately, they probably swarmed because of weather and because of the lack of space in their hive wherever they were at in that moment. So uh now I have like so many bee questions. I, I mean, people that are listening are there. There's going to be half people like, where's the ball talk? But where's the bee talk as well? Uh, how How is a queen selected? Is it queen a species of bee or is it there's is there a voting process? How it, how is the queen selected? Uh, so, I mean, the queen, what they can do is they generate a queen. So if you lose a queen, if the queen dies off, the colony can generate a queen by using what's called royal jelly. And that's essentially chemicals and certain feeding that they're giving and they're extracting from the queen. And they are now uh, supplementing this, this nuke, really. This queen egg, this queen cell. Mm. And weeks later, queen emerges, grows, becomes healthy, starts laying. They tend to her and all is right with the world. Bees will take care of themselves at times what you have to do. So like for that individual, if he would have extracted the queen out of that whole big mass that we saw hanging out on the cord, if you were to get in there and find the queen, boom, you got her and you move her over here. What you would then see is all those bees that are hanging out. You would watch them do what's called the march. They would find the queen, surround her keep her safe because you have what are called the queen's attendants. And there's a certain group of bees who surround her and follow her and feed her and clean her at all times. And it's to keep her as healthy and as safe as possible so she can eat and lay. That's her job. Eat and lay. And if at any point in time her health becomes compromised or there is a lack of production, she will either leave or they will end up offing her and creating another one. Mm. So it's a very cutthroat industry. They don't, bees do not play around. I mean, I've got mm. tons of videos where I've just been super baked, zoomed in on the entrance of the <laughs> hive, put my phone on slow-mo for like 10 minutes, and you see videos, you'll see bees, two of them, circle another one, get them, and then just drag that motherfucker out of the hive, take them out and fly them away and fly them off the platform of the hive. And then that bee tries to come back. They kick them out. Why? Because the bee is either old, the bee is sick or the bee's not working and they are not here for the bullshit. They will Damn. get you the fuck out right now. Bees do Damn. not play. Damn. Yeah, that's crazy. So what I hope that's happened is they were able to gather that queen, which it looks like they did. Because the biggest danger is if the bees are Africanized, which means they are not friendly, 
the majority of wild bees we have in the U.S. are Africanized, which means they are very, very, very angry. They are very, oh, they are very volatile, and those are difficult hives to tend and difficult colonies to maintain. So you try to find keepers that have you know a solid track record of uh, DNA and of friendly bees, and from there you build your hives. Is, are your bees friendly? Very friendly. I just posted as well. Like if you look at the video that I posted last night, like we go into our hives with no gloves. Like sometimes we'll wear just the headpiece, you know? Um, That's my, crazy. My wife way. is in I've there. I've seen you do that. Yeah. And my wife was in the video I just posted. My wife was in there requeening a, cause we just saved, we just rescued a hive. Legit just rescued a hive. The video I have shows the pieces of, uh, the, the pieces of wax that my wife was like rubber banded in place together in the wooden frame so that they'll continue to build out. But the clip that she has inside the hair clip, just think of like a big, a girl's big hair clip on the back of her head in that hair clip inside is the queen and it's sealed. And you put that in the hive and the bee March that I was talking about, you put the queen over here and they all, so you put the queen in the box with the frames and all of the outside bees in her colony will come into the frame and start working. And then eventually there's a little thing of wax underneath that hair clip that the worker bees will chew through to get to the queen because they only know one thing. Got to take care of the queen. That's what we do. If we don't take care of her, we're fucked. Hmm. Do you have one of those bumper stickers like who rescued who? <laughs> <laughs> with an outline of a bee no but i do have sorry about the bicep uh i do have this sweet bee I, tattoo of my queen bee don't be sorry you're trying your best is that in new my, in my little bees no i've had it for a while huh. wow yeah when did you get that i've never noticed that uh oh, like a year and a half ago when i was gonna start or maybe right at the yeah year and a half ago or so i was huh. starting this other sleeve and then my tattoo artist uh wasn't going to be able to make it out for a while. So then I just oh. got stuck with this. Learned a lot today. <laughs> Learned a lot today. Um, we got to get to the Mike Trout talk. Oh, but hold on. I don't want to. Oh, you don't want to make this bees? all about Dallas. No, I don't want to move on quite yet. Okay, because go ahead. the <laughs> actual spectacle of nugs. last night. I don't have nugs necessarily, but I, you know, <laughs> usually I feel like I'm a hater. And I, that B <laughs> spectacle last night was just good stuff. Like the guy, the guy, I read the story, the backstory on the athletic where it's like, he, he threw was out like the first 40, pitch after. Yeah. Yeah. Not, he got <laughs> rewarded with the first pitch. It was like a two plus hour delay or whatever it was by mm -hmm. the, or just short of two hours by the time it got started. And like the video and audio is him being lifted up pretty slowly as those things tend to go <laughs> while the crowd is like Building. cheering him on. Yeah. And I read and I, I couldn't make it out in the audio, but like I read that they played Bonnie Tyler's waiting for a hero. Yes. Uh, no, while I need it was a happening. hero. Yeah yeah. 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 So so like Im just imagine being that guy who had been basically minding his own business. And he was at his kids little league game. He was at his right. kids <laughs> little league game. They're like, dude, Kid we got a fucking emergency. <laughs> literally from a little league field to the to the big leagues in, you know, under an hour. And he's just being lifted up. To like be the hero or not while the music is playing 30 whatever thousand or chanting his name or not his name or just chanting for him. Uh, that's pretty cool. That's cool stuff, especially because he delivered. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah and, got, if, and got if, to actually feel like a hero. If so I'm that's that, cool. If I'm that dude, there's no like he has to parlay this into becoming like a celebrity B rescuer. Like when they call and they need bees extracted, they like if he just turn this into a complete sideshow. Like you, you be this well, dude, like to have him put the suit on, come out in the suit on. Like if they could have turned the fucking lights off music. <laughs> it's so good. Like that is legitimately every beekeepers world series right there. <laughs> he knows. And he's just, be, he's just raising up slowly. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's just, he's just on this scaffolding, <laughs> just saving the world in his bee suit. 
Yeah. Crowd's loving it. It's so good. I mean, that is a goes with, almost goes without saying, but that is a career highlight, I would imagine, for oh. a branch manager of, you know, Pests Incorporated or whatever the name of his you, the company is. You know, just think think about it. You know what I know what I'd love to ask him, but it's great because it's almost like as a and I say average Joe, I mean just normal everyday human being, not a big league baseball player, is what I'm getting at. He went from living a life where he was never going to have 30,000 people watching what he's doing for a profession and having an opinion about it to being thrust into the middle of 30,000 people watching something that he's capable of doing, whether that's what he does for a living or not. Again, I haven't read all the way. Um, and then immediately <laughs> was like, well, okay, fuck pressure's on. Here we go. 30,000 of these people are watching. We gotta get this guy on the podcast. We got to talk to him about bees. Oh, Imagine I would love. Being- yeah, that'd be a sick guest. We should do that. If yeah, you're listening, I'm sure he's a fan. If you're listening, please reach <laughs> out. Um, reach out. Yeah, I mean, if his kid's playing literally, he's yeah. obviously listening to baseball. Is dead. He's not he just a B guy. He's a baseball guy too. Yes. Imagine being like a tax accountant and just waking up and being in in like a gladiator style, like middle of like a fifty thousand people arena. Like, do you got to do the taxes in like under ninety <laughs> seconds or whatever? I'm like, crushing ten ninety nines right now. I can't fucking believe. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, Larry, Larry. <laughs> yeah, I'm terrified of bees. I mean, I don't know how you do it. Like, it's just well, you that's know, like a dog. You can read their expressions. Like, they're like uh, well, one bees, of my friends bees, used to have jerk. a German Shepherd, and he was an asshole, but he loved me. But in order to get him to respect me, he had to like go nuts in front of me, and I had to just no sell it. I had to just be like, I'm not afraid of you. And then he was like, Are you my dad? And then we became best friends and he would follow me around everywhere with a B. You're not reading any facial expressions at all. Like you that, like they could just be buzzing around and you think that they're friendly. And the next thing you know, you're getting swarmed. Well, no. So so here's the thing. Um, bees give off a certain smell when things are starting to go south and you can hear them, but they, you can get a little smell, smell, smell like popcorn a bit, uh, but they'll let you know. They will absolutely let you know, hey, pal, the smoke too much. You're you're moving around too quickly. You're jostling shit like you need to slow down. You're a little heavy handed uh, and they will let you know if it's getting a little too aggressive. So you just got to listen. Got to listen to the ladies. What's the time elapse between them emitting a smell of popcorn Mm -hmm. and you being able to figure that out and them just being like, well, this guy doesn't get it. Um, uh, I, I, I would say I would say I'd say probably a minute or so like a, okay like because you, cause you Cause I think but, it would take me longer to be like mm, popcorn huh <laughs> well then that's when you start digging around where's this where's this coming from and then they this was your face. yeah no yeah how many times have you been stung by a bee Dallas uh I in my lifetime put it like as a beekeeper as a mm-hmm. beekeeper from the day I became an apiarist to today which was fucking years ago uh three three times handling these that's crazy yeah was it like a a misstep or is it just the unpredictability of the bee life two of them were my fault 100 percent. I, I i i went in i just went in super aggressive like mm-hmm. they don't like like again if you move if you move slowly and methodically right they're used to your presence it's almost like a hitter and a pitcher. Like they're the hitter. They're picking up timing mechanisms. And if you start doing shit out of order, or if you start moving a little quicker, they're like, whoa, time out. They step out. They take their time out. They, <laughs> they look over at the third base coach and he's like, well, remember two strikes. He likes to fuck it. So then they get their shit together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Listen, I, I want nothing to do with the bees. I don't want this to become something where, uh, like the next thing you know, I'm at Dallas's B ranch in a, in a suit. Like I'm not, I'm not down for it. I, well, I my my vibes don't give off peace. <laughs> well, just, I just, I please, I beg you. If you do encounter bees in the wild, mm-hmm. don't kill them. Don't swat, just shoo them away. Shoo them away. Don't swat at them. Don't, because the more you start to strike and you find one that's a little pissed off, one that's had a bad morning, she will fucking go back to the pad and be like, yo, Got this asshole over here hanging on the block that is not, they ain't with it. They're not, they won't move on. So <laughs> he ain't with it. Let's go. Damn. 
Well, I learned a lot today. Thank you, Dallas. Yes. Um, the final question is mm-hmm. something that I kind of I, I alluded to earlier. You did. Is this a situation that you think you could have sprung into action and handled it yourself? Absolutely. If need be, like you yep. could have. Yes. Yes. You could have removed that swarm. I could have removed that swarm. <laughs> That's disgusting. Let the man have his yeah. moment. No, that, it's, it's <laughs> great Mr. to see Hill him perform. If need be, on yeah, the I'm just saying, if the A's were in town. Yeah. Yes. If you have a perfect game and you're not letting this this pest guy have his 15 <laughs> right, no, I, 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 I want What's his name? Do we, we've got to know his name. Yeah, it's my, Mike Hilton. Uh, hold on. Uh, Matt, Matt Hilton. Hilton. I'm sorry, Matt right. Hilton. We got to get a hold Matt. of Matt Hilton. Yep. I'm going to send, I'm going to fire off a tweet right now. Yeah. Matt get Hilton. On. I'm going to need to talk Let's to you, pal. Matt Hilton on the pod. So I'm going out to Arizona next month. Maybe, maybe I can track him down there. There you go. Yeah. I'm sure you should be able to. Yeah, I'll be in town for the uh, MLB draft combine again. MLB network. Yeah, we can, we can make that happen. Get Mr. Hilton on. Uh, The MLB season is in full swing and Underdog Fantasy wants to make it a lot more interesting. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports. Uh, Playing their pick'em game is as simple as selecting higher or lower on player stats, strikeouts, uh, total bases, home runs, and so much more. Make entries of all baseball or mix and match across your other favorite sports. You can win up to 100 times your money, and it's a ton of fun. Uh, Jake, where are we at on the Bruins right now? How are we feeling? Uh, yeah, obviously wanted to close it out at home in game five, but up three, two, it's not the end of the world yet. Yeah. Going back to Toronto though. Yeah. Yeah. Toronto game six. Mm. Well, you'll be able to mix and match some socks and bees if you so choose to Jake, um, make sure that you sign up with the promo code Jared though. If you do do that, J A R E D an underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That is underdog fantasy promo code. Jared. Um, now we had some some happy B news. Now it's time for sad Mike Trout news. If you're listening, you're a baseball fan, you probably already know. Mike Trout needs knee surgery. Uh this is uh an interesting development as we are pretty heavy on the Mike Trout narrative discussions on this podcast. Um so I, before we get into it, here's here's a little Mike Trout uh, speaking emotionally about this injury. It's, uh, just frustrating. Uh, we'll get it. Did you feel during the game last night? Um, it's crazy because I'm like, I look back, I'm like, I don't even know when I did it. Or, uh, third inning. After the inning was over, I was running in um, to the dugout. <clears throat> and I felt like a little bit of an ache in my knee. Like, not like serious ache. I was like, oh, that was, that was weird. Then they, they, they didn't think any of it. And then I um, was hitting and running, didn't feel nothing. You know, scoring from second, nothing. And then uh, it was just like after. When I did activity, I sat down, I got back up. That's when I started feeling it. And I mentioned something uh, in like the seventh, eighth inning to the guys in there just to give them a heads up and just to make sure, you know, it wasn't like crazy, crazy. Um, you know, it was just one of them things like, like my body was like, I wasn't feeling it hitting, I wasn't feeling it running. It was just sore, just like, kind of like a, I was kind of telling myself like maybe I just banged it on something and I didn't realize it. And uh, then after the game, getting treatment, was really sore. Um, the plan was just to see how I felt in the morning. Uh, if it, if you woke up, uh, I was sore, just get, get it looked at. You know, I, uh, that was the plan. Uh, last night was tough, tough for me to sleep. It was just, it was just aching all night. Woke up, I texted uh, Frosty first thing and said, uh, yeah, I think I need to just get this looked at. So I cleared my mind a little bit. He saw this came back, just uh, delicious. Do you, do you know when you're going to have this? So uh, obviously it's something that 
uh, it sucks. And it's something that uh, we're kind of getting used to as baseball fans. Mike Trout not being able to take the field. And um, I guess it's a it's a teaser. I don't know if you want to share, Jay Hay, but you have a video essay coming out about not. I mean, it's it's not a negative. It's more just statistical context in terms of where Mike Trout has sort of landed in the uh, once he first started his career. We're talking about this guy having a chance to become the greatest to ever do it to now the injuries have limited him to kind of forecasting it out where he ultimately might land. And it's not it's not going to be anywhere close. And it's because of stuff like this. Yeah, it's not necessarily the piece of news that I wanted to have tie into a project like that. And it's obviously um, it'll be a, a week or so before it or two before it comes out. But um, yeah, the idea being that like we spent a lot of time and justifiably so whether regardless of basically what stat you're using to discuss a, a lot of where will Mike Trout end up among the all-time great players in baseball history and for a while he was tracking alongside the absolute Mount Rushmore like goat players baseball history like and I'm not saying for one or two seasons I'm saying for the better part of a decade Mike Trout was pacing alongside those players. And, um, you know, I, I focused on the, the post integration era because I think th that levels the playing field to a degree where we don't have to worry about uh, certain factors before then, uh, you know, Babe and, and Babe Ruth is removed specifically from the picture. But like in that period, he was basically the greatest player that we had seen through age like 27 or 28. And since that point, and the essay will go into much more detail than we will on this podcast. But like since that point, it has been nothing but a descent down the mountain of greatness, so to speak. And each year since then, more and more people through that same age have passed him to the point where now that he's going to miss a significant chunk of this season, we're talking about him. This is his age 32 campaign. We're talking about him being more like the eighth or ninth best player through that age since integration, as opposed to being the first or second best player alongside Mickey Mantle or Barry Bonds or something like that. And that, you know, th there is no shame. I don't want to make it seem like I'm shaming Mike Trout, but like that's the conversation we were having at one point about this player. And now with another season that's going to be cut short by injury, and frankly, prior to injury, his performance, despite leading the league in home runs, was more like it was last season than it was the MVP winning, like greatest player of all time version that we saw from Mike Trout. But it's just like it, it on one hand, it's a tragedy for Mike Trout a, a, on a baseball level and for people who enjoy watching him and his pursuit of greatness. And on the other hand, it's a commentary on just how hard and how much it takes to be one of the 10 or 15 greatest players in the history of the game, because it requires greatness, not only in your 20s, but through most of your 30s as well. And to sustain the level of play, because if you go back and look at what Mike Trout was doing when he first burst onto the scene, it was a combination of everything that you expect from a baseball player. When you're talking about the greatest baseball player of all time, you think about a guy who, and these are just numbers I'm throwing out there. You think about a guy who might have 40 stolen base potential, 40 home run power, has the ability to hit 300 and get on base, right? Like those are, and obviously going to play great defense. So did Mike Trout check those boxes? Like outside of not having a gold glove, I believe he won like a Defender of the Year award or whatever. But you go and look in, what is it, 2012 to 2019. Those are the years in which he led at least in one statistical category, led the league in at least one statistical category. And over that year span, 2012 to 19, a slash line 308, 422, 587 for an OPS of 1009. Okay. And if you go and look at the last five years for Mike Trout, obviously injury riddled, not nearly the at bats that he had in the seasons that we were just talking about a completely different animal. You could take five seasons, handpick any of the five seasons you want between 12 and 19, 
the worst five seasons there and then what has happened these last five seasons and it's not even close. He's just a completely different player. It's a completely different athlete. Totally. And sucks. I, I was just going to say ahead, for the man. Angels, it's like, you know, DOA at this point. I mean, I don't think any of us held out much hope for their like ambitions for this season, but well, you know, well, they're well, not they're not going to make it through this absence. I, I wouldn't no. think the per- the perspective here that I take away from this when I saw this and I heard him talking the way he was and I heard the emotion is we have done this podcast together now, all three of us, long enough to, in my opinion, start to put to bed the career of Mike Trout. And what I mean by that is we talked about not wanting to sit through or live through a period where his prime was not going to be capitalized on, right? We talked about that way back when. Well, we've lived through that, have we not? And we're now living through and have lived through what Mike Trout on the other side of that athleticism without support around him was going to look like which was Mike Trout never performing on the game's biggest stage. And we've lived through his prime. We're living through the lack of support and no postseason appearances or minimal postseason appearances. And then we're, it feels like we're starting to live through him rounding third and the injuries becoming more of a narrative than what once was, where will he fit in in the game's greatest players ever? I, I mean, I, I want to let Jared talk for obvious reasons, but like the, the name that immediately comes to mind and I've, I never really thought it was going to be like this, Grady Sizemore? but the name that no, well, well, I mean, yes, on a, on a, on a different scale, I guess. I mean, Mike Trout is a far greater player than Grady Sizemore ever could have been, but like the, the Griffey comparison now feels yes. like kind of <clears throat> apt because mm-hmm. they both were all time great level players like in the research that I've done for this trout stuff like Griffey's name is one of the ones that appears tracking alongside but beneath Mike Trout uh, through much of those same 20s and I I didn't see it coming with Mike necessarily but like we're now a couple of this is his third season into his 30s and it's starting to look eerily similar to what Griffey's 30s look like and he just happened to stay on the same team as opposed to changing team. Someone tweeted me yesterday and they were like, you live through it. Is this what it felt like with Griffey? And I was like, it didn't it didn't register until someone just straight up asked the question. I was like, honestly, yeah, yeah, this is kind of what it felt like. But um, yeah, we'll see if um, if there's anything we can get alongside uh, some. Local and I know thoughts. people are going to push back and say that, like, Griffey was way more marketable. And that's absolutely true. But like in terms of their stature within the game that they were playing at that time. I actually think Mm -hmm. it's pretty similar because baseball was thirsty for a star and trout didn't fulfill that. But, Oh, Hey, is this max? Uh, I think it's max. Yeah. Yeah. Oh shit. Hey, what's going on guys? Hey max. How are you, man? I'm doing, doing great. Yeah. Yeah, Get to a quiet spot there. Um, yeah, maybe with a high ceiling and a beam. (laughs) beam. (laughs) <laughs> maybe, maybe a rope. I, don't know. I mean, listen. Uh, this is the first time that we've talked to you since the uh, new iteration of Baseball is Dead under Underdog Fantasy. Uh, it's not like we have to do this this kind of like big time long catch up right now. Um, but we didn't talk to you once we kind of learned that Anthony Rendon was hurt again and now with this Mike Trout thing and you've got Shohei Otani just doing his thing just smashing baseballs with the Dodgers this is this is kind of less of a, a you know reaction to the Mike Trout injury so much as it is a, a check in on your well-being I want you to be okay Max yeah no thanks I appreciate that it only took uh, a month into the season to call me no big deal <laughs> um, you know the other one the other company you guys used to go for it didn't really fit my you know didn't really fit king i've never been a king Mm -hmm. underdog i've been a dog Mm -hmm. i am a dog you are a dog and uh you know baseball for me lasted one month um april to april or march to april and it's uh i think it's time to close the book on the 2024 angels wow Um, it's a dell's team now oh okay 
if you're trying to get on that boat, I, I, I don't know how it goes. It's every week. It's not even, oh, I can't even say week. It's been three days. Like three days ago, you could have been like, all right, well, rough start. You, you know, you lose Rendon, which if you say this like six months ago, like, oh, he's playing well. People are going to be like, yeah, you're on mess. He was playing well. He gets hurt. Uh, who could have thought that coming? And then the trout news yesterday, I think that's just the like, that's the, that's the kill shot. That's the one in the, like, I mean, Jay Hay said it perfectly. Uh, Jay Hay, Greek philosopher, was like, it's a Greek tragedy that I wrote. And uh, it, I, you guys are just kicking me when I'm down. Uh, kind of we're not kicking like. you at all, Max. <laughs> Max, we're not kicking you at all. We, we are Mike Trout fans, obviously, who isn't. Like, there are, put it this way, there are superstars within our game that have crazy amounts of talent and they don't have a universal approval rating, at least in terms of like they get some hate. Like people will find reasons to hate on Aaron Judge just because he's a Yankee. Juan Soto now, okay. same thing. I don't think anyone hates on Mike Trout. Like the only criticism he gets is is because he chose to stay with the Angels and fans want to see him win somewhere. But in a way, that's like a backhanded compliment. They want to see him succeed. Uh but yeah, I mean, everyone loves Mike Chow. This is this is shit news. I don't. I'm not really feeling the love. I don't think I felt the love uh, since you know his. Uh, there was like a couple. There was like a year or two, maybe after his free agency, where people are like, "All right, well, I mean, if he's got to stay, does he prioritize winning?" And now I think that's obviously in all caps written across like the sphere of the Angels. But I mean, nothing great going on over here, and. Uh, you know, I'm curious to hear your guys' take and what what seems to be almost maybe the end of an era with a guy who's 33 with another, you know, going to miss another 80 games. Like, what? Max, I just, just said it. Up again I, next year? I said it for you, Max. I said it for you. We are watch. we've lived through the era of Mike Trout and watching his prime get wasted. We have now lived through the era of Mike Trout not making any meaningful postseason appearances. And the only way for this Greek tragedy to end is the way it's ending right now, which is for Mike Trout to slowly, slowly, because they'll, it's Mike Trout. They'll keep him on the roster. They'll keep him on the team, but slowly just sort of fade away. Become a guy. I don't know if I don't know if I'll ever just become a guy. That's like, that, yeah, right. That would be like Jared's just a guy. Yeah, right. Come on, <laughs> just a guy. I'm saying in terms of like he'll, his name will always carry the weight of a superstar. Uh, just kind of how like Albert Pujols when he was in Anaheim. It's like you know, it's well, it's Albert Pujols, but you know, you look at the numbers and you're like, well, this is. This is not Albert Pujols anymore. It's it's that's, a different that's perspective. Kind of what I meant. It's yeah. it put it like we're but talking about year, Griffey. We're talking year, about he Griffey. Was on pace, like we were just talking about Griffey. I, I can tell you this: there was a big difference between the way I felt when I faced King Griffey when he was on the Reds in spring training, <laughs> and had I have faced King Griffey really anywhere else at any point in time, completely different vibe. I was not looking at King Griffey the same way. When I started, to, I, I looked at him that way for five seconds before I stepped on the mound, and then it was a different look. It was a different feel. It was not the kid that I was facing, and I think that's what that's what will happen to the competitor mindset with with, with Trouty. It's Mike Trout, sure, but it ain't <laughs> it, it ain't that Mike Trout. It, it just couldn't happen to like a like the worst guy to happen to. Like he, he's the I know I'm, I'm going to sound like RDT talking about the Orioles, but he's like the coolest fucking guy ever to step on the diamond. And he's the nicest and he's the most humble. He's the most hardworking and all this. And he gets an injury. I don't want, last time I said Lure Disgrail Jr. I don't want to do that again and pick another player that why not them? But I mean, it's just kind of fucked up that it keeps happening to this guy who like is, was like the face of baseball. And I say was because he is no longer. I don't really align so much with what Dallas is saying in terms of like, this is the end. Like maybe it's just, I'm being naive a little bit, 
But I, <clears throat> for for what I've read about this particular tear, the meniscus tear and the surgery and everything, uh, he will play again this season. I think we will look back on his 2024 season as a yeah. as a wash. Like it's 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 a loss for him. Like this year is. But I still think that like for whatever reason, I think he's just going to roll out of bed in 2025. And if he's healthy, he's going to be an elite player next year. Like I, I, I'm not ready to like close the book on uh, the potential for elite Mike Trout seasons to still exist in the future. And and I'm not telling you that Mike Trout's never going to be a good baseball player again. I'm telling you that we're not going to see any more of these elite seasons from Mike Trout. That's what I feel. I truly feel that way. I think that optimism, I had some level of that optimism entering this season where I was like, okay, he's going to come in and we're going to see like a Mike Trout semi-renaissance campaign. But I, I think what he showed you in this brief period that he did play this year is that He's just not that guy, and he suffered a, I don't want to say non-contact, but like an injury that was like, it wasn't a collision injury. It wasn't he got hit by a 95-mile-an-hour fastball and broke his fucking mileage. handmade bone. Mileage. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. it was something it's that doesn't give me any level of optimism about his ability to avoid similar, if not the specifically the same, injury moving forward in future seasons. So like, and I'm- and- I, I'm closing the book to Dallas's point. I am closing the book on like any level of emotional attachment that I had to the Mike Trout of old. That doesn't mean that we can't appreciate the version that he is now. It doesn't mean that he won't be a good or great player for a prolonged stretches for the rest of his contract. It just means that like this idea that he is carrying a franchise or a top 10 player or that sort oh, of that's long is long. like that. That's just. Uh, this season, uh, if it wasn't already gone, that season has, for me, cl- closed that conversation. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, he's taking the Bill Belichick approach. I, I see it. I, I see it. <laughs> um, I mean, it, this year, he, I mean, the way he started, you know, it, I, I tweeted this earlier in the year before we kicked baseball off. It was like, all right, if we're not going to be competitive in the division, if we're not going to make a wall card, give me an MVP season. Give me a Cy Young, give me a, a rookie of the year. Give me some, something that I can, you know, we need a promo for next year, Mike Trout MVP bobblehead, or, or we need something to get back, you know, to, to roll into 2025. Um, and now it's starting to, you know, with him missing, he's going to miss, what, 100 games, or I don't know how many games, but, like, now we have to start to, is he going to get 500 home runs? Like, 3,000 hits was, like, that was erased a couple of years ago. Is he going to get 500 home runs? Like, we're talking legacy now. We're talking a chase that before was like you can cash it, and now it's like is he? He's got like a well, hundred something to go. And that and that's why this injury specifically. I'm 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 glad Jay Hay said it because I honestly didn't say it because I didn't want to sound like I was just completely doing away with Mike Trout. But the wear and tear because my whole theory has been. Mike Trout now has made peace with his lot in life, his lot in the baseball world like championships and blah, blah, blah. What it, so he said, fuck it. I'm just going to get back to playing baseball the way that I know how, the way that I want to play baseball. You're not going to contain me. I'm going to start stealing bags. I mean, how many, he's already got, I mean, I granted, what was it? Five or six or whatever, but I mean, he's no, had, he more, had as many stolen, stolen bases, the last as many years, stolen Jay bases this season as the previous 2020 to 23 combined. Thank you. So I like didn't the, realize he was hitting 220. Uh, all yeah, I man, kept that, looking that, up and seeing was that he was, he was leading the league in home runs. Baseball, I was like, oh yeah. damn, Mike Trout's back. Uh, but yeah, he's hitting 220. And even his OPS or slugging percentage is like, again, more in line with last season where we were all like, oh, this is a, like a, a diminished version of Mike Trout than it is anything resembling his MVP peak. Like that's bad. Whether it's batting average, his on base percentage is also like 320 or something like that. That's not Mike Trout. No. And no, I know those things I said. are he tied went, together, but like, yeah. He, he went from leading the league in something. In something, whatever you want, runs, fucking bags, walks, batting, like like something. Damn near every year of his career, to the last five years, nothing, nothing, I, nothing. I, well, he hasn't played I, the games. I, so yeah, that's well, tough. well, that's all part of it. That's all part yeah, of yeah. why we're talking about appreciating a guy in year or age thirty five season, thirty six season, still doing it. Because that's how you get to those numbers. That's how you become appreciated and start to earn the whole baseball god 
label and moniker, the Hall of Famer, like that's how. I I know this has nothing to do with Max or or the Angels or whatever, but and I know we're going to lose Dallas in a sec, but it does strike me as we're talking about Mike Trout moving forward. Jared referenced Albert Pujols. You know, we, last podcast two days ago, we were talking about the the atrocity that is Xander Bogart's contract moving forward. I, I know that the important thing from a player end and a union end is that guys get their money, like their total amount of money. I do wonder, though, what the soft factors are, the the like unme- immeasurable like erosion that occurs when you sign these guys to 10 to 14 year contracts that you everyone knows the back X number of years are going to be basically eating the deal because you got great production up front or whatever, or you spread out the average annual value to a point where like on a yearly basis, you were paying them half of what they were worth or whatever. But they spend the last seven seasons of the contract being like targets for fans ire and toiling, Mm -hmm. toiling in a like really reduced version of what we were used to seeing from those players. I just wonder what the, the, the cost is of that from a player legacy standpoint or like a brand building standpoint, because you cannot convince me that Albert Pujols is appreciated in the way that he should be as a top 20 all time great player right now, given the way that his, like, I know the very end was nice, but like he spent the last eight years of his deal being like kind of a joke and Mm -hmm. it didn't necessarily have to be that way for all these guys. I just, I I don't know. That's a separate conversation. It could be a whole podcast, but I, the cost, the cost of it is if, if, cause I totally agree. Like if you're paying for max production at the front end of a, of a long-term 10, 14 year deal, it's that you win a championship in that window. And I think when you look at the trout situation, it's, there's not even not a championship. There's no playoffs. Like it's not even like they didn't even come close. No, no. offense, Max. Um, no, but, you're good. We well, came close in 2020, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, but it's just like you know that's what it is. If you like, I'm trying to think of an example of a player that got uh, a lengthy deal where they faded at the end, but it was okay because you got the championship up front. I, you know, like that. If that's the example. I mean, it's it, they're not even comparable on a star level, but like. Pat, I guess the Patrick A-Rod Corbin is something. second yeah, contract. Yeah. Or like I, I make fun of the Patrick Corbin contract because he's been so bad for so long, but at least you got the championship and he played a huge role in delivering it. Right. Like you yeah. got those two elite seasons up front. So like the last four have been like, oh, this sucks. But at least 2019, yeah. you know, like it's always yep. the second deal. Like you could look at like sale got that yeah. Albatross sale. contract, yeah. but it's mm-hmm. like that came after the championship. Steven Strasburg, Albatross, waste of a contract that came after the championship. Um, you know, I look at someone like CC that aged beautifully. I mean, that was someone that uh, he doubled up and double dipped with the Yankees on big deals. But, uh, you know, you would look back and be like, yeah, we would do that again uh, with CC. So I don't know. It's just it's it's a shitty situation because, you know, I, I guess I didn't realize until Max said it that he's not even in shouting distance of 500 homers or. Like he's not even at two thousand I mean, hits. He doesn't have four hundred. He's shouting distance for five hundred, but yeah, it, he's three seventy eight. Yeah, it it's just kind of crazy. Four hundred next year, and then a couple more years to get five. He's already thirty two. Next next year will be his age thirty three season. I, wasn't it? It was supposed no, to be four hundred this I, year, I, Max. Look, I, I, I was saying I, it's a slam dunk. Two years ago, I was saying I was screaming. I say yeah, five hundred, five hundred. Now it's it's going to be a. Hey, 20, 28 season tickets. Come see five hundred home runs. It's just so it's so fucking annoying in some ways that I, I we've now reached a point with Mike Trout's career, you know, a likelihood where in ten or fifteen years, when I'm having when I'm still doing baseball debates on players' legacies because I'm a loser, like <laughs> it, I'll have to start the Mike Trout argument with, well, if you value peak above mm-hmm. all else, <laughs> right? And it's like, like well, damn, he might like, turn we, into we, one of the greatest the, arguments for it, Ja. Yeah, it was like, you know, we didn't have to yeah, have yeah. that caveat for a long time. And now it's like, well, you know, Mike Trout's first 10 seasons where it's it's again, it's a lot like how you talk about Albert Pools. And that flew by like that, that flew by like that, you know, when he first came, he came up, got, call, got uh, recalled and then got called back up and 
his first like major league stand was like eh, and then he came back up and he won rookie of the year and did all that. That feels like it was yesterday, and now it's you know today, and you get the news out of nowhere on a night where he scores from second on a wild pitch, and it's like the next morning, it's like hey, he's getting surgery. It's like what the fuck happened? Like what? What do you mean? Like Mike Trout, Mike Trout, like. We got Vanessa Hudgens in the stand. Like, what? <laughs> that is true. Shout out to Cole hey, Tucker. Made hey, a big league hey, uh, uh, Tucker, return. Um, hey, he's kind of been balling, but his, his, you know, like his arrival has been kind of dampened by, I don't know, losing the, one of the greatest players in franchise history uh, overnight. Baseball has um, Sure. Uh, yeah, it's, it, you know, baseball is really dumb. Like I, I think. <laughs> uh, aside from like that, da- aside from like Dallas who, who played it and, and enjoyed it and, you know, got paid for playing it. I don't know why the rest of us like watch or, pay, <laughs> you know, like what is the point of this? Like, yeah. I like, you know, and also another, <laughs> the brightest spot. You got, the you start falling in love with people. broadcasters, Max. Start falling in love with broadcasters. Yeah. yeah. Well, I love you guys. Um, <laughs> the, the brightest spot has been watching, you know, my baseball year, my baseball season has been Jared getting back uh, section 10. That's been the funnest. He's like a kid yeah. in the candy store again. And like that, that's been, I've been like, all right, uh, Angels at six, cool, cool, cool. Section ten is coming out. Like with Jared, he's gonna be, <laughs> he's gonna be giggly and and uh... no, yeah. But speaking of broadcasters, what do you think about like uh, Randazzo just like cussing out Major League Baseball every two days? What? <laughs> I, I've, I've, I've heard, heard one or two he, like, of them. Yeah, um, cowards and like, <laughs> yeah. Do you guys like that? I kind of, I kind of like fuck that, but I feel like he's getting like <laughs> fined every two days or something. Yeah, you guys get in trouble for that, Dallas, or not? Well, I I don't know. I mean, look, I'll I'll be honest. I've <laughs> I've gotten called into the principal's office before. Um, I <laughs> I don't I don't know if he's being fined or not. I can't speak to that. Uh, if so, that's pretty strong. Um, but hey, you know, you got to. What do they do? Like write you up or something? Oh, I I don't want to speak to what his issue may or may not be, or what you know. I'll uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, yeah. Uh, thank you to hold you. I'll just say that. <laughs> Hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No. You think I, you guys think I could do that? I could be a broadcaster, right? Yeah, you'd be. Yeah, good. I say just go yeah, for it. Be a level-headed yeah, you'd, voice. You'd, you'd be great. You'd be yeah. great. Yeah. 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 Be a reason. I to think I'm it. like right. I'm. I think I'm right in between player and broadcaster. I could do one of the two. Like maybe player broadcaster. I could probably play, or I could probably broadcast. Yeah, there you go. First ever mic'd up broadcaster who's playing second base. For the oh, Angels. sorry. No, you'd have to be the second because I uh, I am the first ever broadcaster to broadcast a game and also be on the field at the same time. I was ball oh, boy, go. 2018. Good try, Max. Go. Yeah. yeah, no, I don't mind. I don't mind being the second. I'm cool with that. Um, and by the way, do you think the Angels like will move to Nashville like pre 2030 or 2030? 2035. I don't know when the lease is up. Oh. I don't know. I couldn't tell you, but Dallas has to go. Um, All right. He's a busy man. So uh, next no, time, if it. there's an update on this story, we will call you, Max. Dallas, uh, is there another B situation he's going to handle? I think he's handling a B situation. Yeah, yeah we got, we got, okay. um, we're going to be all over the B guy. Matt, we're, we're going to be wrapping with Matt here very soon. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fuck yeah. All right. Love you, Max. Bye. All right. Love you guys. Bye. That's Max. <clears throat> Angels correspondent for baseball is dead. Um, yeah, it's just a tough blow. It's a tough blow. Uh, this, uh, you see this bench clearing uh, brawl last night, Jay? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Oh, you don't sound too fond of it. I'm kind of eh on brawls. I think we've done, we, we've kind of disagreed on this before to some degree. I, all right, here's where I'm at on brawls. Did I love this one? No. I think it was stupid. I like brawls where there's backstories. Like I like sure, brawls where yes. it's like this guy did something wrong. We threw at him to avenge a teammate and he wants to charge the mound and then, then there's a brawl. Like I'm, I'm into that. Yeah, Last like night, that NL Central stuff from like 10 years ago with like Johnny Cueto and stuff like that. Yeah. And the Cardinals, right? Didn't, wasn't yeah. there something? Yeah, that kind of stuff. I mean, That's good stuff. Chase Utley getting thrown at uh, by Noah Sin- Like that had like a backstory. Um, but this one last night was a simple case of someone being butthurt. Freddie Peralta gives up the home run to Jose Siri, I believe, in the third inning it was. And he pimped it, but he always does. Like, he always pimps home runs. It wasn't personal. He didn't look at him. 
He hit the home run. It was a bomb. Like it went over everything. It wasn't even like a cheapie. It was a bomb. And he kind of just dropped the bat and looked down and then ran to first base. Uh, no harm, no foul. I believe in the sixth inning, uh, he uh, he gets drilled in the leg and um, just takes his base. Doesn't get upset about it. Gets hit right in the quad. It's not up in the head. It's whatever. Like, you want to pimp a ball? Like, I'm going to drill you in the ass or whatever. He got him in the quad and he takes his base. He eventually comes around to score. So it was a poor decision to throw at Jose Siri. He eventually comes around to score. <clears throat> then, uh, I believe it was in the eighth inning in a game that was kind of out of hand. Eight, eight to two, I want to say it was. Uh, Abner Uribe. Uh, Jose Siri puts a ball into play. Uh, Uribe has to cover it first. And it kind of it kind of looked like maybe there was like a not it was like a subtle like I'm going to throw like it wasn't like an aggressive throw my shoulder into you. But like they kind of like brushed each other and then words were exchanged and Uribe throws the first punch over the top. Reese Hoskins gets right in there and I think he like fell down. Like I think he was like trying to like push uh, Siri. But in the process, like Siri was already backing up. So right. he just kind of face planted which is dangerous. Like you don't want to lose Reese Hoskins. Like that's when it gets stupid is like you get, you lose uh, your big bopper because of a stupid home run pimp job that you didn't like. Like that's, this is like, I will agree with you here, Jay. Hey, I don't like brawls that the, the crux of it is someone being butt hurt over a home run. And that's my big problem here is I put like the vast majority of the onus on, uh, of my complaint or my issue here with the Brewers. Um, like you, you, if I don't love that Peralta hit him with the three Oh fastball to start with, but I understand that that is still a part of the game and like he was ejected and Murphy was ejected. So like, okay, that, you know, business over with, I guess, but like, I, I know there's some discrepancy or some dispute as to who initiated the, fracas between siri and or uribe like whether it was siri saying something or the shoulder bump as you're saying uribe threw the punch right he threw the first punch he did okay so so your team gave up the home run your team drilled a guy with a fastball and your team threw the first punch case closed Mm mm-hmm and not interesting to me other than making fun of the Brewers for it. Like and they won because big. to your point, like they're just being sore losers, like sore yeah, winners, sore losers. Yeah. Yeah. They won the game, but like sore losers within that inst- like that specific instance. But yeah, like, uh, yeah, if you want to brawl, like, let's make this like these guys have hated each other for 10 years uh, and-, and preferably not the Bryce Harper. Um, <laughs> what's his name? God damn it. Uh, the guy who gave up the bombs to Harper and then fucking took it took oh, it out eight circling. years later or whatever it was. <clears throat> yeah, preferably not that kind of decade long feud where some losers waiting ten years to get back because a guy hit a home run. But anyway, I kind of respect yeah. that. You've bit, read though. me correctly. I know you do. I know. You, I, I, <laughs> I respect I the pettiness of it. I think it's weird. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's an elephant. He didn't forget. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm team. Siri and Team Rays, if I have to pick a side on this topic. Yeah. I, I love a good brawl, but it's got to mean something more than just yeah. don't, don't celebrate too much. Yeah. Sorry, I hit the ball too hard and yeah. far. Speaking of another dumbass beef that took place, Juan Soto, what are we doing, man? I love Juan Soto. And it, t- it takes me a lot to still love a player if they're on the Yankees. Um, <clears throat> like, I love my guy, Judgy. I loved Andy Pettit back in the day. I uh, love Mariano Rivera. Juan Soto. I, he's, I mean, he's a Yankee. He looks like a Yankee. He's employed by the Yankees. But until he signs that extension, he's not quite a Yankee yet. Um, he's not willingly a Yankee. But last night, Juan Soto hit a, let's call it 450-foot bomb that almost hit the warehouse. And he does what Juan Soto does. Like, I think it's, it's one thing <clears throat> if... If it's a rare occasion to kind of stare down a pitcher or to huff and puff around the bait, like that's what Juan Soto does. It's how he gets his edge. It's how he intimidates uh, there. It's no different from Randy Johnson back in the day as a pitcher trying to intimidate hitters the way that he did. 
Uh, hitters can then try to intimidate the pitcher right back. I have no problem with that. Um, but this was from uh, Brian Hoke, who covers the Yankees. He said, Juan Soto said he stared at Dean Kramer because, quote, he didn't like the shuffle. I bet he didn't like the homer, too. But, like, it, you lost the game. Uh, whatever. I'm, I'm in. We need, but he, we need some f- feuding. What? You know, it's all about winning or losing in this instance. The home run itself wasn't to go ahead or to right. tie. Like, I, again, I'm not going to say that I, like, I like showboating. I do. Like, I don't care. Like, none of it bothers me. I think you can look stupid doing it in some situations. I didn't think Soto looked stupid in that situation because I think it made it four to two at the time. So it's like, it's still a game. Yes. Like if he, if he pimped it and they're down 13 to one and it was a solo home run, then you may look a little silly, but it, you're still in the game and you may, you may be thinking like, yeah, like I, I, I hit the shit out of that and I know we're going to win this game anyway. We're the Yankees, <clears throat> but um, they go on to lose this game. And he said, I bet he didn't like the homer too. So like, you're just, it's fine if you want to say all that stuff and act that way, but you're just setting yourself up to get dunked on. Like if if I were a Yankee fan, my reaction would be like, mm, I wish you didn't say that because now the comeback that Orioles fans are going to say, I bet Soto didn't like that loss. Like you lost the game like that. At the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Like hitting homers is cool and everything, but you got to win the game to talk shit after. It's kind of just it's kind of a lame move to talk shit after you lose. I guess, but like, all right. So, so he does he does the homer. Right. He mm-hmm. absolutely annihilates that baseball. Right. Yep. And onto Utah Street. And he goes and then there's a there's an exchange. Right. I haven't been able to tell from from v- video or articles who initiated the exchange as they're going around. But it's it's an exchange between Kramer and Soto. And then he's presumably asked after the game what that was all about. And so mm-hmm. I don't I don't view it so much as shit because like. They lost the game and he subsequently asked about it. So like he can't say nothing, right? He can't just be like, it's the second line. It's not the first line. It's the second line. You can say, oh, he didn't like the shuffle. That's why I stared at him. But to say, I bet he didn't like the homer too. It's like, I bet you didn't like the loss. Yep. And yes, you're right. That they, they could absolutely come back with that and say, I bet you didn't the loss. Mm-hmm. I bet you didn't the second straight loss for that matter. Um. Mm-hmm. I like Soto embracing uh, his role as lead villain of the Yankees. I like him taking the opportunity to get a dig in at a pitcher that he uh, blasted a monster, monster home runoff against a team that we may see the Yankees battling uh, for the division all season, kind of like in, in an old school 90s sort of way. So I, th- I, I understand why people would find it ill-timed. I'm just saying that uh, the bigger picture here for me is that I I like what Juan Soto is embracing. I think it's in the fans well moving forward, even if it was kind of an yeah. No, I, I like can that. I can agree with I think that. I it take. was a good. <clears throat> yeah, so kind of what was it? 20, 2022 that Donaldson got traded to the Yankees. I, I said, you know, this is this is the attitude injection that the Yankees need. Like personality wise, they're very boring. Uh, talent wise, they were in the middle. And, and I wasn't saying that you were going to acquire 2015 MVP Josh Donaldson, but you were going to get a guy that uh, <clears throat> had some attitude. He was going to be colorful with his comments. And he was not going to be your prototypical uh, Yankee that just had no personality, no energy, no passion, no nothing. Um, now, Soto comes in and he has that like, fuck you energy. And he uh, is obviously one of the most immensely talented players in the league. And I think if you were to ask Yankee fans, hey, like, are the vibes around the team different this year? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what do you attribute that to? Uh, Juan Soto being on the Yankees, like it's just it feels different now. Um, so I'm all for it. And again, to your point, he's got to answer the question. Well, what was that all about? Oh, he didn't like the shuffle. If he had just ended right there, that's fine. You're explaining what that was about. 
But then going on and saying, I bet he didn't like the homer too. Now you're setting yourself up to get dunked on, which I wish he didn't do. Yep. I don't want I don't want Juan Soto getting dunked on. I That's think all. he's going to have the last laugh in most of these scenarios, so I'm okay. I'm okay with it. Yeah, well, I mean, if the if the Yankees play the Orioles in the playoffs, that's something to look out for. Now there's now yep. there's legit beef. Oh yes, we all like beef here. Yeah. Uh, Jose Abreu got option. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of people, a lot of people that saw this were like, I didn't know that you could do that. I wasn't aware that you could take a dude that's been in the league for over a decade and option him. You can, but you need the player's consent. So I saw a lot of people saying, you know, credit to Jose Abreu for agreeing to get optioned because uh, he first has to admit that there is a problem. And when you are 22 games and 77 plate appearances into your season, and you are 37 years old, and you are hitting 099, 099, with a negative 20 OPS plus and a 269 OPS. Yeah, I think that it's it's not a matter of uh, opinion that things aren't going well. I think we all kind of look at each other and we we agree. Hey, this is uh this is a little bit of an issue here. How do we how do we fix this? How do we work on this? Uh, so he has accepted a minor league assignment. To where he is going to go down and and work on some things. What was your reaction when you saw this, Jay? Hey, uh, I admire him for accepting the assignment. I don't think there is anything to work on. Um, I think it's just over. He's done. And yeah, I mean, and he's thirty seven years old to the point that you just made. Um, so that he would be done is shouldn't come as a great surprise, and is certainly no um, tarnish on his you know, MLB baseball legacy or his overall baseball legacy, but there have been 250 players this season to receive at least 70 plate appearances. And regardless of what metric you use, whether it's fancy or traditional, uh, he is dead last. He's last in WOBA. He's last in weighted runs created plus he's last in OPS, et cetera. Um, and that's unacceptable from a player of any age. It's unacceptable from a player at any position. It's it's beyond unacceptable for a player whose only value is supposed to be his bat. Jose Abreu is providing nothing defensively. Uh, he's, you know, <clears throat> he's largely not even participating on that side of the ball. And uh, he's just terrible. Um, and he's making 19 and a half million dollars. Yeah. And, and it's not like it's just a one month sample uh, where last season things were all good. Like he already showed an enormous amount of decline from 22 to 23. He had shown decline from 21 to 22. Um, so this is just rock bottom and there's really nothing you can, there's no stat you can splice. There's no analysis you can do where you come out thinking this guy can improve and get back to a contributor. He's hitting 125 against fastballs. The problem is, is that he's two for 31 against non fastballs. So there, there's nothing to splice there. His ground ball rate is at a career high. So he's not he's not driving the ball with any authority. It's a lot, a lot of ground balls. Um, he's he's being challenged with more fastballs and fastballs in the zone than he's ever seen before. Pitchers have, you know, lost respect for Jose Abreu's ability to punish any sort of pitch. Uh, even fastballs down the gut, basically. So, um, it was a it was a contract that was questioned by a lot of people at the time that it was signed, um, and it has go gone as no, it has gone as poorly as anything could possibly go, um, because he's unplayable and probably unfixable. So you're probably looking at this season and the next season of the deal being a complete and utter loss. Uh, and he provided nothing last season. So really what we're talking about is a three year. What was it? Sixty million dollar deal. Fifty something like fifty eight and change. Yeah. Three year, fifty eight million dollar deal where the Astros got literally negative value um, out of it. And I don't think there's any reason moving forward why that's going to change. So, you know, what's crazy uh, is like he tip of the cap on a great career. But his final season with the White Sox, he hit three oh four with an eight twenty four OPS. Like the, he got MVP votes that year. 
the drop off has been insane. He has had 671 plate appearances as a Houston Astro. He's hitting 221 with a 632 OPS. But but, but <clears throat> even to that point, and you're right, all that's obviously correct. But like, what do you see in that final year with the White Sox that's way different than every other year that Jose Abreu provided? The homers were down. Yeah, the the power production and specifically the homers were way down. 15 homers in a full it's not like he was limited. He played sick he got 679 plate appearances uh in that season and hit 15 homers which games. is exactly yeah, which is exactly half of the number that he had hit in 2021. So yeah, he finished 17th in the MVP. Okay, I stopped caring after a certain point, but like his numbers were in decline. That had happened starting in 21, even when he had hit the 30 homers. He did hit um, the year that he hit 15 homers, though. He hit 40 doubles. So it's like the homers were cut in half, but he added 10 more doubles. No doubt. But we're still talking about a guy who hit it, who had a 446 slugging percentage <clears throat> as an offense only player. Like, yeah, that's not the foundation upon which a, a $19 million a year free agency deal is built. Um, there was way too much batting average involved in that slugging percentage, and um, obviously the bottom has fallen out uh, now that he's gotten to Houston. I forgot that he won the COVID year MVP. Played in all 60 yep. games, drove in 60 runs in the 60 games, uh, led the league with 76 <laughs> hits, had a 617 slug for a 987 OPS, led the league in total bases. I, um, yeah. I mean, that was that was not even four full seasons ago. And you look at the MVP vote from that season and it's like, what the hell happened to these people? Like, <laughs> I'm not here's the top 10. We don't need to spend any more time on it. Here's the top 10. Jose Abreu, Jose Ramirez, who is like the only outlier here. DJ LeMahieu, Shane Bieber, Mike Trout, Nelson Cruz, Tim Anderson, um, Luke Voigt, Anthony Rendon. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Some of these guys are playing in Mexico now. They're literally not even in baseball, and they were yeah. MVP finishers three three full seasons ago. DJ LeMay, who's still trying to battle back to the big leagues. Luke Voigt, I believe, is playing in Mexico. Uh, Tim Anderson will be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like I was, I was about to say, like didn't deserve a big. Like I feel like he deserved yes. a, a second chance this year, but he's not doing much with it. No. Um, so it, and Rendon, Trout, and Bieber are injured. Abreu yeah. is going to be out of baseball by next season. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, and, I think the Astros are going to probably eat it next yeah, year. Yeah, they have to. Him. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, maybe some team will sign him to a minor league deal if he gets released, just to like they'll go back to the White Sox, kick, kick they'll it be around. Like, ah, with fuck it. We got to sell tickets. Yeah, mark my words. Jose Abreu is the fucking opening day first baseman for the White Sox. Or the Marlins. The Marlins feel like a team that would sign up for that. Yeah, they're like, oh, you're Cuban? Yeah, come on over. Yeah. They will do that. They've had worse ideas. For the Cuban community in Miami, they will definitely sign Jose Abreu. (sighs) Wow. That's tough. I mean, I just I mean, we kind of already have talked about the twins coming back. They, they've now won nine straight since we talked yep. about them winning seven straight. We can't not note that they've won nine straight games. Uh, I don't know what the discussion is, because we've already had the conversation about, oh, they won seven straight. Do you think that they can come back and win the division? Like right now, they have won nine straight games to still be in fourth place in that division. Like we don't really talk about the Tigers much. Um, but they're they've had a nice little start to the season. They're 17 and 13. The Royals are are still winning baseball games. They're 18 and 13. They're two games back of your Cleveland Guardians, who got off to a 19 and 10 start, albeit they've lost their last two games. Uh I get does does the Minnesota Twins winning nine straight to still be in fourth place, does that change your perception of the division? Like are like did we kind of underrate going into the year, how I guess good the central would be. I think we, I think we definitely did. Although I think we were less guilty of that than a lot of places because in the season preview, I know we were, I I shouldn't say robbed. We, we, we did not have the opportunity to do as many uh, spring training and preseason podcasts as we otherwise would have done. Um, Yes. But 
uh, uh, to the extent that we did preview the 2024 season, I think we were generally more aware of the possibility that the Royals and Tigers would be better than, or or at least more interesting than people expected, or or they had been in previous years. So did I did I or we think that they would be four and five games above 500, 30 games into the season? No. Um, so the part that we underrated is just how interesting it would be, kind of top to bottom, with the exception of the White Sox. Um, I Fangraph still gives the Twins by far the best chance in the division to win the division and to make the playoffs. Fangraphs hmm. has the Twins at 45% to win to win the division. The next closest team is the Guardians at 25%. So you can wow. add the Guardians percent and the Tigers percentage and you do not reach the Twins percentage per Fangraphs. So, wow. People can take what they want from that, but they still believe that this is the best roster by far. Um, there's reasons to believe that. I mean, they're more likely to get healthier than they have been to this point. They're getting a couple of key pieces back. Um, I, I just think I, I'm sticking with my opinion that I think the the perceived talent gap between the twins and everybody else to start the season is less than we thought, or a lot of people thought, the projections thought. Um, and I still think they can and maybe should be treated as the favorite to win the division. But I think four teams have thrown their hats into that. And it wouldn't be totally surprising to me if we get to leading up to the trade deadline and the Royals and Tigers are viable options to win the division or win the wild card. If those front offices dipped their toes into adding to the current roster as opposed to subtracting because they're nominally retooling or rebuilding. I think that's particularly true for the Royals, who spent quite a lot of money this offseason. I know the Dodgers got all the attention, but in non-Dodgers teams, the Royals spent damn near the top of the league in terms of free agency acquisitions, um, and and several of them have worked out very nicely. So uh, Seth Lugo, to name one. So um, mm -hmm. I would expect them to add. I just think it's an interesting division. It's way more interesting than it's been in maybe a full decade, which is great. Sure. And I, I will admit, this is the first time that I've looked. It's May 1st. I didn't look all of April. But this is the first time, and it's still way too early to be looking, but just for conversation, it's the first time I've looked at the wild card standings. Yeah. And if the season were to end today, the Royals are in and the Tigers are tied with the Red Sox um, for that last wild card spot. And the Twins are just a half game back. So, you know, for all the talk about the, the Central being a weak division, You've got the division winning Guardians. You've got the Royals as the number two, and you've got the Tigers tied for the, that third spot. So, I, I'm telling you right now, if if it comes down to September and we're we're, you know, not we're, we're watching a resurgent Astros team trying try and climb back into the wild card picture versus like you know the young and scrappy Royals or the Tigers. I'm 100% throwing my hat into rooting for the Royals or the Tigers to make the playoffs over the over the Astros because uh, I, I think it would be great for the game if someone like Bobby Witt Jr. was uh, oh. given the platform of a postseason appearance or, mm -hmm. you know, to a lesser degree, if we got to see Tarek Skubal, you know, uh, take the mound for game one and Riley Green season is looking really, really impressive in a lot of ways if he got to go to the playoffs. So, like, I'm, I, I would love to see some of that new fresh blood uh, in the playoffs, uh, as opposed to some of the, some of the teams we've gotten used to, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look at, uh, look at what a postseason run did for some of the names with the D backs last year. Yep. I think, you know, most people were familiar with Corbin Carroll, but I'm talking specifically mm -hmm. like the Merrill Kelly's of the world. Like no one was talking about him. Yep. Um, so yeah, Zach Gallon, I think everyone had an idea, but it's like, how many baseball fans really sat down to watch a Zach Gallon start, you know, take that yeah. in for seven innings and, and think about what it did for Corbin Carroll. And then, you know, multiply that by whatever, if it were Bobby Witt, because while we can debate who the better actual baseball player is, and right now it feels like Bobby Witt, but we just got done watching Corbin Carroll have an amazing uh, rookie season. Uh, what you can't deny is that there is a sex appeal to Bobby Witt that just does not currently exist with Corbin Carroll and yeah. the, the star wattage power that Bobby Witt can generate uh, with, a, with a World Series appearance, uh, I think would be 
pretty epic for the sport, actually, in, you know, kind of the sub Otani face of the game conversation. I I've never seen you in a baseball jersey before, Jay Hay, and I myself, I I haven't bought a baseball jersey of an active player in a long time. If the Royals make the playoffs, I will buy a Bobby Witt Jr. jersey. I will do that. Yeah, I, I'm not a wear a jersey guy. I, I'm, you know, kind of that soapbox guy who I, I don't totally feel comfortable wearing the jersey of a person who's younger than me. Uh, you yeah, know, uh, kind of same. Yeah. And I'm 39 now. So like everybody in the league is younger than me uh, for the most <laughs> part. So like that, that's an all encompassing approach now. But like I have the Harold Baines jersey that I'm going to hang uh, when I put up the new stuff for the uh, for the podcast. And I, I got to say, like, I'm a fan of the Royals white. I'm a fo- I'm a fan of many of their uniforms, but I'm a fan of the home Royals white jerseys mm. in general. Mm. A wit, a wit junior version of that would be pretty crisp. Yeah. He's yeah, a, he's a very good candidate for if you had to purchase a, a, a current player's jersey, who would you choose? I, I sure. need to think about it other than I think Otani's probably my answer still, but like other than Ellie Ohim, Cruz for me, probably it's that's between a, that's Bob, a good one. like it depends on like that. Like I do factor in the color scheme. It goes beyond yes. just, you know, who's the player that I like the most. Like I, I. Like, I love Nolan Arenado, but I don't unless it was kind of like the powder blue Cardinal jersey. I think I would maybe rock that. Um, yeah, but but it would be like a like I can't just get like a Glasnow Dodger jersey. Like, I can't do that. And um I'm trying to think of who I, I would have. I, I would love to get a throwback like Tampa Bay Rays uh, Glasnow jersey. Like, I would do that. Um uh, probably de- definitely I would do like the black mesh Ellie De La Cruz or like the, the black with like the l- red lettering reds. I would get an Ellie De La Cruz Jersey uh, and then like the powder blue Bobby Witt Jr. I would do that, but I'm with you like as more so for the Red Sox because I, I think I was at opening day and I, I always get Jersey shamed now for whatever reason. When I go to Fenway, uh, people are like, what do you think you're too good to wear a Jersey to the socks? It's like I have, press passes like I can't be on the field for batting practice looking like I'm about to fucking take the yeah. field f- to play the game uh, you can't do that um, but then it's also just like I, I if I were to wear a Red Sox jersey to a Red Sox game it would not be of a player on the team currently yeah it just wouldn't be yeah like I'd wear a jersey of like a Cleveland player I guess not now because of like the Wahoo stuff but like I, yeah, of like a throwback. I'd wear like a Tommy or a Lofton or like a whatever, or, you know, yeah, whatever, a Bayerga or whatever. But like Nomar, Pedro, Poppy, Pedroia, like yeah. I'm totally cool wearing all my those. relationship with those people, which was totally one way because they don't know who I am, of course. But like my relationship with those people was different as a as a 12 year old than my relationship is with players that I'm watching now. We're like. I'm not trying to do a big J journalist thing. Like your press pass point is, is nailed it. But like, yeah, that's kind of like the, me- the mentality that I had when I was working at w- really, regardless of the stop, like throughout mm-hmm. my professional career, whether I had a press pass or, or a credential, which was when we were on the road, I'm obviously not going to wear gear of a major league baseball team while I'm there with ESPN or major or for that matter, major league baseball. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So it's just a little bit different. And like, could I wear that stuff now? Yeah, I could. But like, you know, I, I'd rather do stuff like, you know, put up like old baseball cards, you know, behind me or whatever, or do the ba- like the Harold Baines jersey. But like if I had to if I had to pick one. Uh, Witt Jr. has thrown himself into that. I You said Ellie De La Cruz. I just want to add one other name that I think has thrown himself into this sort of conversation this season for me personally. Also, that- because I really, really like their home whites. Gunnar Henderson. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a good pick. Yeah. Because he looks like, like the real fucking deal and he may just be the best player. Like, I know we, we can do the Adley Gunner debate again, but like, in terms of like, what is he doing on the baseball field and is it exciting? Gunnar Henderson to me is, is the answer for the Orioles right now. And, you know, he's also a middle of currently a middle of the diamond. Uh, player as well so i just uh yeah. i think he he's not quite wit level 
uh, but he's he's on that sort of track for me. Yeah, like I have the City Connect jersey, but there's no name on the back. Like I would wear that. Like Jake, you're in your mid twenties. Like, is there? A, I mean, but we're also Red Sox fans. Like we have zero stars. We have Rafael Devers, and outside of that, we have no stars on our team. Like no one where you would just be like. Yeah, I feel totally comfortable buying this player's jersey because they're going to be here for a long time. Yeah. Or it's like a jersey that uh, 20 years from now, I'm going to put it on. People are going to be like, yeah, that's sick. Like, <clears throat> we don't have that guy on the team right now. The only guy I would consider is Brian Bale, but he's also 24 years old. So that, again, to your argument is like, I feel like it's easier for me because I'm 26, but it's tough to be in your 30s wearing a jersey of a 24 year old guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I have a fuck ton of jerseys. They're all players that are older than me. Uh, but yeah, that's not to like shout down anyone that, that does do it. I think it's just a different set of circumstances for me specifically when you know the guys in the league. And if you do have a press pass, you most certainly cannot I, wear a jersey on the field before the game. Like you just can't do that. I, I played in the summers in between my uh, semesters of college. I played in a uh, softball league with my high school friends and we got like full, like I still have it. Like it's that durable. It's like a really nice jerseys made. And uh, we each had to pick numbers and I picked the number of Kurt Schilling. And that Mm. was the last time I dabbled in that sort of thing. Uh, That burned Mm. me. That's not aged very well i have to make up a different reason for that number now um so i'm just you know i'm just just i'm just justin you know and i like baseball justin (laughs) yeah yeah oh we got news it's not good i don't oh i feel like i can't play the breaking news for bad news but it is bad news god damn it it's not horrendous breaking news what is it Uh, Grayson Rodriguez Ugh. placed on the 15 day injured list with right shoulder inflammation. That's bad, man. Yeah, something we're gonna have to keep an eye on there. Uh, as the Orioles um, continue to state their case for the best team, not just in the American League East, not just in the American League, but maybe in all of baseball. They have overtaken the Yankees for first place in their head-to-head series. They are now a game up on the Bronx Bombers. And uh, not to say that Grayson was pitching super well recently, but, I mean, he's a guy. He's a big part of what they're trying to do. Yes. Um, I mean, no, it's been an up-and-down season, but, I mean, perhaps this explains some of it. Perhaps it doesn't, but uh, I, I, I'm bummed about this because... He was a guy that I had earmarked as, you know, kind of appointment television. Let's see if he's going to be breaking out sort of thing, in part because watching the Orioles is fun anyway. So when they have a guy Mm -hmm. like that on the mound, it's it's perfect to tune in. Um, Hopefully it's nothing serious and he's back, uh, you know, around the minimum. Yeah, he had a 263 ERA through his first four starts, gave up seven earned in four and a third to the Angels and then pitched uh, in the opener against the Yankees went five and two thirds shut out um, three walks, three strikeouts. So um, he pitched well and I mean, he basically had a one shit start. Grayson Rodriguez, 15 days. So we will keep an eye on that situation. Uh, the rest of the topics that I had were kind of Dallas topics. I had uh, Mason Miller, what he did to the pirates last night. Um, Alec Manoa, out dueled Paul Skeens. I saw that from you, Jay. I didn't even know that they went head to head. I'm just I'm just looking at the game logs for Skeens, and the next thing you know, I see Alec Manoa is the opposing pitcher in the Skeens start. I mean, you know, I've been pretty critical of the Pirates uh keeping Skeens down, but if Alec Manoa is gonna outduel you, then maybe he's still got some work. Uh Skeens, How's he been Skeens doing? Does. Manoa. I feel like we only hear about him when he stinks, but I haven't heard about him in a while. So that must mean that he's had some good outings. I actually don't know that answer uh, because you're right. I'm guilty of the same thing of, you know, shaking my head when it goes badly, but not necessarily following up to see how that's going. Um, 
So far this season at uh, AAA, he has a 6.50 ERA in four starts. Let's see if we can uh, get some more specificity on that. Let's see if that's turned his, around. His earned runs by start oh, uh, in AAA. Not great. Okay. Four earned in three and a third. Two earned in five and two thirds. Six earned in three. And then this start, uh, okay. one earned so run he in has, six innings. He's made five starts overall this season, including the one at A. If you want to just do the AAA starts, he's made four. He has one good one. Yeah, so That's in his good. four so starts it, in AAA, 18 innings, 23 hits, 13 earned runs. He's walked seven, struck out 26, given up four home runs. It's a 650 ERA. Uh, opponents are hitting 315 with a 932 OPS against him. Uh, oddly enough, too, uh, and I don't know how predictive this is, but right-handed batters are hitting 432 with a 1299. That's correct. 1299 OPS against mm. him. That's not going to work. No. In 39 plate appearances. Woof. Okay. A 571 BABIP from right-handed, so, right-handed hitters. I love how talking positive about Alec Manoa just evolved back into... Man, it saying how much he sucks. Yeah, yeah, tough. tough break. Yep, Dallas ruined him. <laughs> Dallas absolutely ruined him. Guys talking about how he could get launched up in you know an escalator to defuse a B situation and can't even fix Alec Manoa's career. Right, he's pitching great on the road though. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, how's he doing? How's he doing at night? Uh, I don't know. I don't think they got that somehow, from the minors. Somehow, reference has a split for the minor leagues of younger batters and older I batters. I, I don't know what that means necessarily, wow. but both of them have over 1,000 OPS against him. Mm -hmm. So old or young... Does not discriminate. <laughs> no, he does not. No. No, he does not. There's no. employment opportunities for all ages against sure. Alec Manoa. Opposing batters have a 1341 OPS against him at home this year. But <laughs> just digging in on the guy <laughs> in two road starts opponents, 195 with a 415. Actually, no, a 647 OPS. So we just no, got to get him on the road. No, that's good. Because what else I was looking at was, is that when the bases are empty. Oh, yeah. Batters are hitting 395 against him <laughs> with an OPS approaching 1100. Mm -hmm. But when there's runners on. He elevates his game, and he's only allowing a 948 OPS. Yeah. That's, a, that's so, an improvement. I think there are a lot of ways you can break this down. Mm -hmm. They all suck, actually. <laughs> but. Damn. Uh, uh, there was a video going viral, and Jay Hay That sucks for Alec Manoa. Sorry, man. He's been does. listening to an hour and 40 minutes of this podcast, and then he just gets to the end of it. It's yeah. like, oh, damn, they're shitting on me. I think, he, I think he could listen. He might listen. Yeah, and I assume everybody does that we talk about. Um, I'm a big Alec Manoa fan. I, I'm a big fan. I don't have anything against the man. No. Just, just uh, the numbers are his what numbers. they are. Yeah. yeah. They are what they are. A uh, video went viral yesterday. I was actually I was out to dinner and I saw ESPN was talking about baseball and I was like, wow, this must be really uh, something important here. And it was a <laughs> video that wasn't even true. It was uh, Ellie De La Cruz recorded the fastest throw of all time at 106.9 miles per hour. Uh, that ended up not being true. No, it was just and, a glitch. Uh, my take on this is uh, a little inside baseball in that. Uh, I know exactly what happens when StatCast produces a, a wonky number that all of the StatCast gurus know is not correct. Um, and it's a place with uh, its hair on fire and it's Slack channels going crazy. And, you know, don't put, you know, because then because then what happens, right, is that StatCast produces that reading and network sees it and MLB social sees it. And then ESPN sees it maybe, or, if, or, you know, Bleacher Report, and then it's out there and you can't fully put it back in the can mm -mm. after it's out there. So I was seeing even today claims of Ellie De La Cruz's throw being the fastest in StatCast history with no follow-up uh, that it was in fact in error. Um, 
And I, I just, you know, Mike Petriello, among others, I know deal with that kind of stuff like intimately. And it has to be very frustrating when the most viral clip that StatCast related of the season is total bullshit. And you have to spend your whole time telling everyone that this piece of wonderful equipment uh, and, and technology that we have grown to use and love and appreciate um, and have been encouraged to use uh, is spitting out stuff that's not correct. That's yep. got to be frustrating for lots of people. Yep. It doesn't happen often from, from what I understand. No, 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 no. I'm not trying to say that it's like a, a, a totally unreliable tool or something yeah. like that. It's just when, when it does, it's often on extreme situations like the other, the other, the one that comes up most often is home run distances, where it's like it, it produces a number that is in one direction or another seems not correct. And, um, you know, they kind of kind of reel that back in mm. um, or whatever it is. And, you know, people get very upset about their home run distances stuff, too. Uh, maybe less so now that Sadcast has fully taken over uh, the situation. But I just remember at the beginning where it was like, you know, these homers that people thought were, you know, 725 feet. They're like, oh, that's a 490 foot homer. They're like, what the f are you talking about that? Mm -hmm. You know, whatever. Statcast. Yeah. Uh, I think the last thing for me here, because like I said, I, I've got some other like Dallas stuff, but um, Alex Bregman hit his first home run of the year. Shout out to Alex Bregman. It's a big one for the Houston Astros. Uh, and then the last, the last note that I have, Justin Havens. Yes. Logan Webb, my National League Cy Young Award pick, mm -hmm. came into last night's start against the Boston Red Sox with a 19-inning scoreless streak, which we promptly shat upon. Uh, that got snapped in the first inning, and the Red Sox went on to win this baseball game four to nothing. Um, we're just we're staying under the radar. I, you know what? This is this is my working take for section 10, Jake. I, I think we we have to we have to go on to win the series. If we lose the next two, then I'm abandoning this take. But if we win this series against the Giants, my working take right now is that I I am going to enjoy the fact that we are under the radar. People aren't talking about us as a potential sleeper team in to make the playoffs. And I'm gonna continue to perpetuate the narrative that we suck. Because I, that's what I want people to think. I want to sneak up on the rest of the league. And right now, I feel like if we're if we're working good at bats against someone like Logan Webb, who's a very, very good pitcher, and we're able to scrap across some runs here. Again, still, we're the dumbest team in the league. Nobody dumber than the Boston Red Sox. We are the dumbest team going. Um, but if we can just stay out of our own way and just make the routine plays, I think we have a good team. Like I tweeted... This morning, and I know that some of these guys that I, I mentioned in the tweet are on the injured list, but they'll be back soon. Brian Bayo, I think, will be back soon. Um, but the combination, Jay Hay, of Nick Pavetta, Cutter Crawford, Tanner Houck, Cooper Criswell, who pitched last night, five shutout innings. I think he's got like a 165 right now. Uh, and Garrett Whitlock, those five Red Sox starters combined have a 152 ERA with 116 strikeouts and 118 in the third innings. Like, we've got guys. It's not a, like, I think, in, now that we've turned the calendar to, eight, uh, to, to May, I think the one thing that I think this job has taught me is just how long a baseball season is. Mm. And I think when uh, baseball fans, if you are watching the full 162 games, it's very easy to get caught up in a series, in a week, in a couple of weeks, it's very easy to just live in that two week space. And if you're playing well, to think that my team's great. Um, but it's almost like as you're as you're climbing the ladder and then once you get higher and you look down, you're like, holy fuck, like I am really up here like that. Those first few rungs that I climbed, that feels like th four hours ago. I've been climbing this thing. So I, I it's May 1st. I'm trying to temper my expectations. I don't want it to be July 27th and I'm tweeting out shit like, remember how fun April was when we were like the five starters had a sub two? Like, I know it's not sustainable, but I think the question is, are they are they good? 
Um, I, I feel like, yeah, you know, like there, there is a plan here. You can see a deviation from how they were approaching pitching last year compared to this year. There's a plan. So it's whether or not the league makes an adjustment to that. Yeah. I mean, we, we've covered the Andrew Bailey, Dave Bush stuff. Um, yeah. Having, having interacted with Dave Bush when I was a kid, like, it's just so funny to me that he's become like this hated figure uh, in, in Boston lore. Uh, but yeah, man, I mean, it, it, some of those things look very real that are going on with some of those pitchers, Hauk in particular. Uh, and I, I think there's a lot more reason for you know, medium-term excitement about the Red Sox uh, if this is what the pitching staff or is even close to resembling. I, to your point about the season and you know, a reminder about how long it is, that's part of, part of why it's easier to uh, experience the baseball season, I think, the way that I do it as opposed to the way that you or Jake do it more so I, I know this is a national pod too but like i get to kind of hop around and be like "Ooh, ooh, the royals are interesting right now or like "Ooh, the Orioles." like i'm tuning in for the orioles tonight or the mariners rotations red hot i'm going over there you guys are like riding with the red Sox on a daily basis where it absolutely feels much longer because there's so much more ebb and flow in to consume it that way so i i tip my cap to you guys um but i love the cadence of working a baseball season. I love going full bore for the baseball season and then, and then reaching an end and being like, okay, let's reset and let's get ready to do it again. Don't you, doesn't like a part of you feel sad that you'll never get to experience the high of like uh, a championship? A hundred percent. Yes. Yes. I, I just, I can't fake that though. Right. So yeah. Um, in 2016, like it, I, I got to go to the Chicago portion for that World Series, and that evoked some emotions in me that I hadn't expected to experience. It it made me remember that there is like an element of fandom in there that's different than how I usually spend the season and the day day to day stuff covering the sport. But um, I'm also realistic that that itself is eight years in the past, and um. I just don't have the connection to this current roster that I did to even the 2016 team or the 2007 team that lost to the Red Sox or, you know, or certainly to, you know, 97, 95 or any of the other seasons around that era that they could have made the World Series, but didn't. So just a different, just a different thing. But yes, part of me is absolutely sad, but I've, I've come to grips with that's how I consume sports uh, a long time ago. It's how I consume the NBA. It's how I consume the NFL. So um, while baseball holds a place that those two sports can never totally touch, um, you know, to view it from the angle I do is is a cool experience in its own right. But yeah, I'm never going to get to that pure like, holy shit, the team that I just rode with for 162 plus the playoffs just delivered a World Series to me. Like, unless my daughter somehow becomes like a hardcore fan of a team <laughs> and we experience that together. I just don't think that's uh, that's going to happen. Although I live very close to my dad now, and if Cleveland were to mount a serious World Series push, I think the viewing experience would be really, really cool. Um, so it's not totally in the rearview mirror, but it is different. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like when I like I envy it to a degree because I mean, again, no one wants to hear it from me. But because uh, we've seen the four World Series titles, but we also see a lot of shit <laughs> like the the yeah. in between of the championships is shit. Always shit. Yeah. So. I, I do remember, though, riding alongside you for I, I know I was not there for the very end of the 2018 season as far as employee of Barstool, but I I, I was there for most of the 2018 season. and. I just remember like w what a what a ride that was for you and that you know that that's a high that like I know you're still chasing to a degree and may never mm -hmm. honestly may never get to experience again no offense because yeah that's the type of season that you don't necessarily replicate but um but I do remember what that high was like looking at it from my perspective and being like damn that's that that's the ultimate payoff to ride with a team 
to build content around a team and have them take you on that sort of magical journey. It's cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I remember like people <clears throat> were giving me shit for crying. Like I I am like cry constipated. Like I can't I can't elicit that or I, I can't express that kind of emotion in my day to day life. I feel like uh I just ha always have to keep it moving because of my job. Like I tried to explain this in, in therapy the other day. I was like, if there's something shitty going on in my personal life and then something going on in my professional life and then something going on uh, in like my family life, it's like I just got to keep moving because uh, like trying to explain like the concept of the podcast to my therapist being like, it's it's. Like we're not sportscasters, we're not broadcasters. I was like, I look at it more as like a comedy podcast. Like it's entertainment, but we talk about baseball. But it's a comedy element. And if I'm miserable, then I can't be funny. And if I'm not funny, then we it's not a good show. So I I just I push all my feelings down <laughs> always because I have to. Uh, and then when the Red Sox won in 2018, it was like it it was a happy cry. Uh, because they won and I was exhausted and it was just the end of all of that. And we, I've never been closer to a team. So like, you're personally happy for the players on a level that you wouldn't be if you were just watching on TV at home. Uh, it was also because like you mentioned the connection with your dad, like it, it was the first world series without my grandfather and like, I mean, that was like a, a a bond too, like with me and him. So when he he passed in 2016 um, and we knew he didn't have much time, we didn't even think he was going to make it to opening day. So like we would just like rewatch, like I had like the World Series DVDs and like the full length games. So like in his like final days, we were just rewatching the 2013 World Series like the playoff games, like in full, like the, like that, cause that's all like, we weren't going to have opening day with him. So yeah, it was, it was a bunch of reasons why. And then just also, you're just, you're, you're finally just processing the entire year all in that one moment. So I'll never, I'll never be ashamed for crying on camera after the 2018 world series. Like that was just like so many emotions for so many different reasons we're just flooding out like all the same time. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was surreal because like you add the element of the podcast and Jake was there. So Jake, like, like I remember it was like me, Hubs, Dallas and Dana B was filming. But obviously Dodger fans had cleared out by that point. And we were sitting like four rows from the field. And I just. Like it's almost like your brain is buzzing, so you can't even like process what is going. Like I, I think I literally had like my hands on my head too, because like my fucking skull was was rattling. Um, and then I remember like looking behind me, and there is just like a sea of Red Sox fans, and I wasn't expecting that. I was like, we're in Dodger Stadium, like I'm expecting like Dodger fans to be there, but it's just like a sea of Red Sox fans. So now on top of just being overly stimulated and overwhelmed by that feeling now you see all these people and they're holding like section 10 flags people are asking for pictures and i'm fucking crying in them I'm like yeah like let's go like it's just i don't know it's uh it's a it's a very like for anyone listening uh that you you've never lived to see your team win a world series i truly fucking hope that you get that moment if I never get it ever again for the rest of my life, like that'll suck. But like, I'll never forget uh, what it felt like to be there. Like I, I got to see two. Like I was at the 13 clincher too. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that if you're a baseball fan listening to this podcast and you've never seen your team win a World Series, I truly hope you get that moment because I there's nothing like it. Like at least so far in my life, like no personal accomplishment has come close to watching the Red Sox win a World Series. Like I've done a lot of cool shit in my life. It's nothing compared to that. So I, I hope that I hope you get that moment, Jay. Hey. 
Yeah, I don't think I don't think I'm going to, but um, the sport has still uh, provided me with a lot and a lot of snapshot, not just employment stuff, but like, you know, snapshot moments that uh, are significant, you know, memories with my family. Like I've told I've mentioned um, when I got to take my grandparents, who are the whole reason that my family and, and I grew up a Cleveland Gar- uh, Indians Guardians fan. Uh, when I got to take them to the Jake and like have them chat with Tito when he was the manager and, you know, he gave them real time and wasn't just like, you know, a wave from the dugout or something like that. And like, you know, re- really got to talk with my, my grandparents and my dad. And like, that's, that is not a world series. Um, and it's certainly not a world series with people that you have like real relationships with, but, um, it was something that baseball has given me that I could not possibly have given my grandparents. Uh, if, if I hadn't been in that position and that's one of a few instances of that, but that's one that certainly sticks with me because they're like, like your grandfather, he, they are no longer with us and you know, they were the driving force behind the entire Cleveland thing. They took me to, you know, uh, league park, uh, when we went to go visit Cleveland, which is the old stadium, which looks more like a little is currently like a youth baseball field actually, um, but is where the Cleveland baseball team used to play um, when my grandfather was growing up at different times. So like it goes back my 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 uh, <clears throat> my grandmother's uncle uh, was a scout for Cleveland. Um, so like it's it's not a it's not a tenu- it's not a tenuous grasp to the Cleveland organization. It's a real thing that's come up through my family. But like um, at some point. It for me at least it became more about the relationships that it helped to strengthen or add to than it was about what was actually happening with the Cleveland baseball team on a day to day basis and riding with it in that regard. So, um, quite the tangent we've been on, but hopefully mm-hmm. people appreciate you know yeah. baseball fandom and stuff like that. Yeah, I think they do. Yeah, I think they do because it's relatable. You know, you remove the name of the team and you slap on another team and it's just it's all it's all the same yep so all right um jake's takes uh just what a podcast we got here we're leading off with a detailed process on how to (laughs) remove a swarm of bees from a stadium and then ending it with just a heartfelt talk on what it means to win a championship Mm. sweat's the best pod in the game (laughs) it is hell yeah you're right it's a great observation it's a great observation jake uh final thoughts any nugs jay hey I, I do actually i'll lean back into what i do best uh two tigers nugs one good one bad we'll start with the bad one uh it occurred to me today that uh while a lot of positive things are going on with the tigers the fact that their literal number one overall draft pick spencer torkelson stinks uh may be a problem for them moving forward He's hitting 216 with a 588 OPS this season, and we're now up to over 1,200 career plate appearances where he's hit 221, 301, 388, which is a 689 OPS out of a guy whose entire value is bat driven. Um, that's not going to work. Um, and you have to wonder how close we are to like a this guy's overmatched. We, he may need to go down and figure it out sort of thing. Uh, on the good side, though, they did lose the game, which kind of sucks. But Jack Flaherty. Wow. Yeah. What Four a start yesterday. Tickets. A real fuck you start to the Cardinals uh, from mm. the former Cardinal Jack Flaherty. Uh, first Tigers pitcher with 14 plus strikeouts and fewer than seven innings pitched since Max Scherzer 14 years ago in 2010. And uh, if we go by specific number of pitches, he threw 93 pitches. To rack up those 14 strikeouts, he's the fifth pitcher in the pitch tracking era, which of course goes back to 88, to record 14 plus strikeouts in in a start of fewer than 95 pitches. The only other examples of that are Tyler Glasnow earlier this year, Hunter Green last season, Garrett Cole in 2018, and Steven Strasburg back in 2010. So uh, in terms of do you want to see a start with an enormous number of strikeouts, but not very many deep counts and pitches thrown? This was the start for you. And lastly, you know, of course, nothing but respect to Buster Olney, of course, uh, technically gave me my podcasting start when I was at ESPN, but he tweeted yesterday about Justin Turner 
approaching a number of career benchmarks and milestones. He talked about hits. He talked about homers. What he didn't mention is the most important milestone that he's rapidly approaching. And I'm not going to spoil what's going to be a future Baseball is Dead podcast segment and maybe the first Mm. one of its kind in the 2024 season. Mm. But I would encourage anybody who is a fan of baseball history to go ahead and visit Justin Turner's page and see what number he might be close to um, and see if that number is 38.8. So, oh, wow. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Wow. Kind of weird for Buster to kind of overlook that, miss that, whatever intentional, unintentional. I'm not totally sure. Feels intentional to me. It does feel a little bit intentional. I don't know why he's not embracing the Baines meter and Club 38.85 and what the Institute's trying to do. Um, but yeah, Justin Turner, keep an eye out, folks. A lot of people have been asking me, yeah. are we going to see a return? Of the you know what meter in 2024 and i said folks i'm on it we just need the players to cooperate okay and justin turner is our best bet for a near-term celebration wow those are my final thoughts wow that is something that is something because if you take a look it's uh 38.8. You've got Justin Turner is the closest active player. Ah, no, Starling Marte, excuse me, is the closest active player. Yeah, we can't do that. Oh, he's already passed? He he passed and then very quickly had a shitty rest of his season. But as the rules of the Institute state, uh, there are no re-celebrations. No, 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 no. no. Uh, George Springer, 36.4. Uh, we're going to see someone by the name of Shohei Otani this year. I, can I just say something? And I know this is yeah. more of an offline conversation than it is a podcast conversation. Mm-hmm. But we absolutely fucking need a t-shirt if Shohei Otani win and if Shohei Otani Pat gets into the Baines situation. Limited edition, because, Limited yeah. edition Shohei Otani Baines meter collaborative effort. Um, <laughs> it's going to be quite the t-shirt yeah it's just above and be beyond regular of- Baines meter merch we need a t-shirt when Shohei celebrates that accomplishment I want I want it to look like uh, like a, a referee like holding up a champion's hand and like pointing to him I want it to be Harold Baines holding up Shohei Otani's arm and pointing to him while Shohei has a championship belt in the other hand don't we have a t-shirt uh, guy don't y- we do. We should just tell him that. <laughs> yeah, I'll have. I'll. I'll get him on it. Okay. I'll get him on it. Also, unrelated, Jake. We need a Clark's ketchup uh, T-shirt. We're so overdue on that. Yeah, we gotta. Let's let's have a let's have a merch meeting this week. We need a merch. Uh, let's. Can, uh, I, can I get invited? Because I have yeah. to. If if I don't get Bane's meter merch out either through myself or through Underdog, people are gonna riot. Happen. Yeah. No, we're, we're gonna get it. We're going to get it I think the, right. like the people keep asking me about like the merch. Uh, I just got the samples a couple days ago. They look awesome. So we have like the thumbs up on that. Um, so we're going to be putting out. I think the, the, the initial drop is going to be uh, podcast logo merch. Once we get the podcast logo stuff out there, then we will start churning out the bit specific. Makes merch. a lot of sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Love it. I can't wait to buy all of it. Or have it sent to me because <laughs> yeah. I work there. Either one. Yeah. It'll, mm-hmm. Either way will be great. Yeah. Alex Bregman could also have a celebration this year. He needs to get going. A lot of these yeah. people are older players who need to get going. That's yeah. why I'm a little bit concerned. Yeah. Um, Trey Turner could get there this year. Yep. Salvador Perez, you said no shot. I don't. I think I said Will he get there at all versus will he get there this season? Yeah, that is what I said. Yep. Yeah. Although I will say, since we briefed Salvador Perez note, uh, there was an article on The Athletic yesterday that noted that he has one of the largest year-over-year increases, 23 to 24, in barrel rate, which is one of the stickiest stats going in terms of sticky, meaning is it going to stick moving forward? Mm. Um, So there may be something that 
I, I wouldn't say overlooked because I didn't really look at all, but like that may be more real about Salvador Perez's uh, start than I uh, had previously thought. So, so never we'll say never. Well, I'm saying never to the him reaching the Baines, the 38.8 yeah. line this year. I am saying never to that. Yes. Yeah. Do you think do you think Juan Gonzalez would ever consider coming out of retirement to <laughs> I pass the bit? He's at 38.7. I've I've mentioned that before. I said, what sort of like what sort of life circumstances or like in like psychosis were you under where you walked away from the game yeah that close mm. to the greatest accomplishment that you could ever hope to achieve and mm-hmm. like i i know we talk about ideal interview guests mm-hmm. juan gonzalez is like shockingly high on my hypothetical interview list for bid because i would love to ask that dude that question and i would love to see <laughs> yeah. what the hell he thought about the question because he's probably like what the fuck are you talking about All right but uh, I think that would be great to get yep. his real answer to why he walked away from the game on the doorsteps of greatness. Yep. And and forgive me for not knowing. Do you have to get to 38-8 or do you have to pass it? So I wait until the the player passes. Okay. Because Maglio um, Ordonez is on it. Yep. Well, and also like, you know, I I, I didn't have the funding to celebrate when Maglio was doing it. You know, I, I right. wasn't set up like business wise at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, but that would have been, I wonder how I would have re- reacted back then because, you know, it would have been so in its infancy that I probably would have been excited to celebrate anybody. Yeah. But you really do have to pass the line to get in. Yeah. And I think if, if he ever did pass it and get in that Dallas would be perfect to induct him because literally couldn't have done it without him. I mean, was a huge driving force for Maglio huge. getting like massive. In fact, I think Maglio's best bet to get over the hump is to somehow get Dallas Braden back onto a major league roster. Maglio comes out of retirement, maybe pops a few bombs against, mm-hmm. you know, that soft toss and lefty. Uh, and then is, you know, before we know it, we wake up and he's at 39 flat and we can have a whole Maglio thing. Yeah. Uh, 18 at bats, six hits, two of them home runs, Dro- drove in six runs, hit 333. With an 1151 OPS against Dallas Braden. And I believe his average selected. exit velocity was 145 miles an hour on average. <laughs> yeah. Against, yeah. Yeah. He didn't strike him out once. No, Dallas didn't do that. That wasn't no. part of his game. No. Walked him three times. I'm assuming all intentional. People don't know this, but 90% of the outs Dallas Braden recorded in his career were in the perfect game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Most of the rest of the time, he just ended getting fucking his tits lit. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I miss that guy. Dallas Braden? Yeah. Ah. I mean, not really, because once he clears out, it gives you and me time to really shine and Jake. But Right. That is true. Dallas Braden, let's see. Who hit the most home runs off Dallas Braden? God. The so numbers. Shockingly enough, the number is two. So there, there are a few guys that are tied with two. It is Maglio so like Ordonez, a- Brandon Inge, of course, Jose Guillen. I had a tough time with the fucking Tigers, huh? Yeah, yeah. Jeez, Bob, Bobby Abreu got him once. It's probably some. There's probably some like legit names where you're like, damn, that's pretty cool that I gave up a home run to this guy. Oh sure, sure. Andrew Jones should be a Hall of Famer. Justin Morneau, Hideki Matsui got him. Josh <laughs> Hamilton, that one's cool. Or it was until he became a piece of shit. Adrian Beltre, Hall of Famer. Mark Indeed. Teixeira. Mike Napoli, World Series champion. Tory Hunter, that one's cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean... We could do a whole. I, I think that could be a future Wednesday segment. Just like fucking name guys who hit bombs off Dallas Braden. Just yeah. kind of like that old that classic inner uh, Twitter thing. Like guys can just sit around and name old baseball players. Like, yeah. let's just have a segment naming dudes who torch DB. Yeah, he also had real uh, hard time with some angels here. The most hits he allowed to any player. It's a two way tie, ten hits. Eric Ibar and Sean Figgins. 
Brother, I think you're going to find that Dallas Braden had problems with lots of people. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Lots, lots of batters. Yeah. Uh, the, Cle- the Cleveland franchise hit 390 against him for his career. The whole mm, franchise. The whole franchise. Yep. Seven 390. hits to Mauer. <laughs> Damn. Seven yeah, the Reds. Mauer. Seven hits to Ichiro. He faced the Reds once, it looks like, and somehow gave up 10 hits and let them hit 357. Yeah. Five hits, five hits uh, against Miguel Cabrera. Faced the Red Sox four times. They hit 346 with a 916 Jeez. OPS against them for his career. That's so bad. Four hits to Jeter. Mm. That's pretty cool. Evan Longoria, four hits. David Ortiz, four hits. Nelson <laughs> Cruz, four hits. Wow. That's cool that he faced all these guys. Johnny Damon's in here. Sammy Sosa? Dallas faced Sammy Sosa? That's pretty cool. Yeah. Gave two hits to him. Of course. But he struck Dallas Braden. I'm going to ask him about this tomorrow. Right? Yeah, tomorrow. He faced him seven times and struck him out four. I want to see what the... I wonder what the most plate appearances is he recorded against any one batter who did not get a hit against him. Like, how many times did a person have to see Dallas before they were just like, I got it. I got this shit figured out. Like, who did he Let's own? Let's see. Oh, the answer is Gordon, nine. G- Gordon Beckham. Yep. Yep. We both found it. Okay. So, he, he owned Gordo. Uh, a lot of people <laughs> did, that unfortunately, house. for Gordon Beckham. Yeah, that was kind of the problem for him. Was <laughs> yeah. he, stu- he sucked, too. Uh, <laughs> he sucked. <laughs> He went 0 for 9 with four strikeouts against Dallas Braden. That's like literally impossible. We, Jake, book Gordon Beckham. We got to talk to this guy. <laughs> Be like, what was, what was wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> Do you, you know? You had nine chances against DB and didn't get one fucking hit? Not one. Do you know who Dallas Braden struck out more than anybody? It's, it's I just, actually. I, yes, yeah. because I just sorted by that exact stat. So yeah, yeah I do know. <laughs> That's crazy. That's a good one. That's a yeah. nice tip. Of, that's a nice uh, feather in his cap. Nelson, Nelson Cruz. Cruz. Seven yeah. strikeouts. Seven yep. strikeouts. Good yeah. deal. Wow. And that was shitting on Dallas Braden. Um, that was really good. Yep. I feel Sponsored like we did by... that for Manoa and we did that for Braden. And then that's fitting in a way because Dallas ruined Manoa. Yeah. Eye for an eye. <laughs> If if Alec Manoa is going to catch some strays, it might as well uh, be Dallas who cursed his career that also catches some strays. Sucks to suck, and it sucks to make people suck. You mm-hmm. know. Yep. Yep. Um, all right, we will be back tomorrow with more of your favorite baseball podcast in the whole fucking world. It is baseball is dead, and we will conclude our week of podcasts on Thursday, May second, just for you guys. On behalf of Justin Havens, Jake Yazzie, my name is Jared Carabas, and we'll we'll see you tomorrow. We out.